So fun fact with this one. If you tried Google searching this episode's title, Wavering Hearts, before 2020, you got one of the background tracks to Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. After 2020, pages and pages of walkthroughs on an insufferable Final Fantasy VII Remake side quest. With Blues gone, Enzon can no longer act in fulfillment of his duties as a net saver, thus just goes back to work as the vice president of IPC. But even then, it seems like he's doing naught but go through the motions. Still, Neto passes by, wanting to talk with him and see if he can't return an old, long-owed favor in helping him get Blues back, just as Enzon played part in him getting Rockman back almost 60 episodes ago. Look, just call Kent and he'll pull a fist of morality, and he'll be as right as rain. You can even ask him to use the battle riser if you want. That's $20 million after conversion. In 2005 money terms. And yet, yeah, Enzon does want Blues back, but he knows there's no easy way back, at the moment, from Darkship Corruption. At best, Blues would be locked up in quarantine, with Enzon still not being able to help Neto and Rockman fight as he did before. Thus, he feels it might have been better if he just did other things dissociated from the job, to not be underfoot, as he does trust Neto to be able to fight. Worse, Neto checked on the progress Silas made on creating a vaccine chip, and they're no closer than when they started. Whatever the corrupted program in the chips is, it is somehow black boxed inside the program of the chip itself, and they're having no luck in cracking it. Rockman though tries in his own way to help Enzon as well. The sole unison system that allowed Rockman to save a part of Blues within him, seeming to resonate more openly with his feelings, making Rockman want to provide some solace to Enzon, even though they're not having an operator nearly synchronized with those feelings that Blues actually had. And in its own way, it does seem to help. The Dark Lloyds, however, are not as joyful about the shifted status quo as one might think either, as despite just joining their ranks, Blues has been promoted above all of them into Nebula's active Navi Field Commander, it taking one of them being outright deleted to get it through their heads that what Laserman and Regal say is the law. Some join the dark side for the cookies, others do it for the brownie points. Enzon goes to see Annetta in the hospital, recovering there from her kidnapping, which affected her physically worse than what was previously shown, that or her old injuries weren't quite healed yet when Nebula involved her, with Annetta openly regretting her part in Blues' corruption. And goddamn, this is a very well-staged moment with the pair interposed like that. One of the strengths of this episode is it's very atmospheric, appropriately dwelling on the helplessness the cast feels in being unable to save one of their own from what's been done to them, and accenting it with an appropriate melancholic mood as they all independently try to work through it. This is the fourth, and sadly last for this season, episode directed by Harume Kosaka, and it frankly shows far better what they can do than the previous ones by, you know not bogging down their episodes with nonsense, but actually telling an appropriately paced story with regards to losing someone you care about, and how someone feels about that loss plays a big part in that. So allowing the runtime to actually focus on conveyance of that emotion, and having a director that knows how to deliver that, it's important. Also, look at what ends unbrought. White Roses. White Roses! Since the Dot .hack reviews, I've looked a bit more into flower symbology, and man are white roses one of the bigger ones. Given to someone in mourning, they can represent wanting to comfort them, but given to others out of that context, it can represent devotion, and even young love or affection. So yeah, another point for the shippers here. Still, we can't dwell on this forever, as Nebula has targeted a model who's trying to get distributed a line of clothing that has computer processors woven into their make. Wow, I can't even begin to imagine how expensive those are. Thus making her next fashion show be under tighter security, with Neto also on hand. The model, Eve, showing off for Neto the capabilities of her line, 
with the models able to use the processors to generate soft light holograms. Still kind of silly, though, as the reason we don't try to make stuff like that wearable is, well, body contact with all our skin oils and perspiration can cause corrosion to circuitry over time. Getting electronics wet is always a bad thing, and you'll have to wash the clothes at some point, and flexible circuitry? I've had to work with those with some of my models, like the MGX Unicorn, and every point where a circuit bends, that is a new point of failure. Now, if the wearable computers are just all about those brooches that contain a computer core with other accessories that interface with it, that's something different than what is being described initially, as they keep saying it's the clothes themselves and not just the accessories. Worse for this, Nebula's stunt is just a feint to get at an aerospace and tech research office, which is housed in a building that is attached to where Eve's fashion show is taking place, which fits for their general subterfuge schemes too. Make the heroes be too focused on one thing to realize Nebula's goal is entirely different. Though to complicate matters with Neto being on assignment, who should show up for the show but male? And this would make more sense if we'd actually seen male be consistently fashion inclined. But, well, there are only so many cast members. So male has to take the designated girl hit on this one. Worse, her meeting with Neto distracts him so he doesn't notice the Dark Lloyd Sparkman using the accessories as remote terminals with which to hijack the model's bodies and infiltrate the lab. The soft light hologram interface allowing Sparkman to remote hack their way in, thus allowing them to raid it far more subtly than would otherwise be possible with the dimensional areas, which would immediately tip off everyone. The various properties of the devices meant for fashion effects actually working to screw over all the implanted security, which rather shows the creativity of just how far the plot of the week is going, with just the idea of portable soft light holograms. Kenichi Yamato was behind the story on this episode, and this makes me wonder... What the hell is up with the inconsistency with this guy? As he does keep writing awful episodes of this show, but then every now and then, we get one like this. In looking back at his awful ones, well, I can't help but feel the problem might be he's bad at comedy, as there is no comedy to this one. Hell, there isn't even a chance for a Neto's an idiot insult remark to slip in here. The front half is focused on Enzon's melancholy. The back half is focused on the villain plot of the week. There's no chance for the caustic comedy aside to take over, as it has been his Achilles heel in the previous ones we've discussed. Alongside Yamada's preference for repeatedly redundant and repetitive, fill-the-time dialogue that is still present here. Still, the second the power goes out, Neto realizes something's up, and immediately gets ambushed by the hypnotized models. It takes time for them to get free after that, in between which it's realized Yuriko had actually set this all up by impersonating Eve using her physical data in the wearable computers, which vastly expands her ability to infiltrate to unheard levels, which unfortunately is never seen again. With her goal here being to, in fact, gain access to all the world's satellites from data in the system, which ends on having caught on to what was going on before anyone else when he heard of where the fashion show was moved to, has already removed. Still, they escape this as Rolls and Tenet can admit a counter note to the supersonic vibrations that's the root of the model's hypnotized state, disrupting it long enough for Neto to finally get a chance to send Rockman some battle chips. Sonic Boom! With this, the models are freed, but Yuriko escapes, with assistance from Blues, who taunts his former friends with his full shift in loyalty before leaving himself. The wrap-up. We have Get Your Groove Back to Enzon, as he tries to find his way without his partner, and realizing how much it meant for him to be there. We have Subtle Shipping, for the visual theme stuff between Enzon and Aneta. We have Fashion Disaster, to the Nebula Plot of the Week and them hijacking a fashion show to do it, and the same but applied differently to Roll in her cybernet clothing that actually ends up hindering her from fighting. And we have Redundancy Offices of Redundant Offices, for Kenichi Yamada's dialogue issues. Continuing the Dark Blues arc makes this an important episode, but one of the more skippable ones past the point it stops being about Anzon's moroseness, since that's picked up better in the next episode. 
The plot of the week isn't bad either in its plotting or execution, but the actual dialogue is the hindrance here. Still, for what we've seen from Yamada thus far, it's certainly one of his better ones. And all I can really ask for sometimes with some writers is some form of improvement. And yes, I am amused by the fact that I can use Mega Ranger jokes this many years later.